Welcome. Uh, my name is Danny and I'm the Director of Programs here at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. And I'm gonna play a quick little promo video we have for this November speaker series uh, and give people another minute to join. Okay, it's six o'clock, let's get started. Thank you all for attending tonight's program. This is a, a screening of Making Ties, the Changdong Village Project, uh, along with the, the Chinese Railroad Workers of North America Project. Um, as we wait for another minute for people to join, please feel free to let us know where you're all viewing from in the chat box. So as uh, it'll be really cool to see where you're all coming from. I think at the last lecture, we had someone tune in from Michigan. All right, we got Thousand Oaks, Falls Church, Santa Barbara, Petaluma, Ventura, Fremont. Cool, cool, great, Menlo Park. Yeah, please keep them coming in. We love to know where you all are uh, tuning in from. And also I'd like to spend a, a moment to thank all of those who have served in our United States Armed Forces. Today, as you all know, is Veterans Day. And usually we have a program uh, to commemorate this day, but unfortunately our site is still closed uh, to the public due to the pandemic. Unfortunately, um, um, yeah, we usually have a, an event, but, but this year we don't. Uh, nonetheless, on behalf of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation, I would like to uh, take a second to recognize all those who have served. Um, so whether it be active duty, guard, or reserve forces in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, Air Force, or now the Space Force, uh, please let us know in the chat uh, so we can thank you for your service. And so for those who are just coming in now, um, my name is Danny and I'm Director of Programs here at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. And uh, we are uh, a state historic park here in Santa Barbara. We have the, the Presidio State Historic Park and we are also a nonprofit that is in charge of Casa de la Guerra here, which is a, a historic house in Santa Barbara. Uh, we are very lucky to have the Griffiths Foundation sponsor this event. Um, we usually have the Asian American Neighborhood Festival and Asian American Film Series uh, that is also sponsored by the Griffiths Foundation. Um, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic, those were also postponed. Um, but they were willing to uh, sponsor these virtual events uh, focused on the advancements and, and the preservation of and archaeology of Asian American places. Um, so it's important for us uh, because we, you know, part of our educational mission is to inform the public about the Nihon Machi, the Japantown, and Chinatown that used to exist here in Santa Barbara uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so sharing this, this unique history uh, here at the Presidio State Historic Park is, is something we, we really enjoy doing. Um, so thanks to the Griffiths Foundation. And we have a, a really quick promo to share with you guys as well uh, about other upcoming events here at the Trust. And they're all virtual, of course. So let me go ahead and share this with you. So that was a quick little uh, preview of, of, of other upcoming events and, and all shot in, in here in Santa Barbara. So we, we hope you can, to welcome you guys uh, one day if you haven't been to Santa Barbara before. Um, so uh, now I'd like to um, introduce Barbara Voss, um, who is the program's director of, of the uh, Chinese Railroad Workers of North America project. Um, and she will then later introduce her team, Jocelyn and uh, Chelsea, along with the filmmaker, Barry Fong. So Barbara is an associate professor of anthropology at Stanford University. 
She is a historical archaeologist whose research focuses on 19th century migration from southern China, currently studied through four interrelated projects. First one, the Market Street Chinatown Archaeology Project, a community-based research program developed to study and interpret the history and archaeology of San Jose's first Chinese community, the Interdisciplinary Chinese Railroad Workers of North America Project, the Changdong Village Project in Kaiping, Guangdong Province, China, and the Arboretum Chinese Labor Quarters Project on the Stanford campus. So we are very fortunate to have Barbara with us today. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. And it was delightful to see uh, many familiar names show up in the chat screen when people were checking in with their um, with their where, with where they're viewing from. And we also want to invite you to participate in a quick audience poll we'd like to take have you take. Um, we'd like to get a sense of who in the audience, how many people in the audience have visited southern China before um, Guangdong, Macau or Hong Kong, um, which is the area that the film today is about. And it would be really great for us all to get a sense of um, how familiar the audience is with that area. And, um, oh, let me just close the poll question. There we go. Now I can see the screen again. Um, so we're excited to hear about that. And we're also looking forward to the Q&A. Um, this film is without question a labor of love. Um, it documents the first archeological investigation of a home village of 19th century Chinese migrants. And it developed through a collaboration with the Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project through a quest to really understand the conditions um, that railroad workers came from, and then also the impact that railroad workers had on their home communities in China. We were very lucky to develop this project with our partners at Wu Yi University in Jiangmen um, in Guangdong province, and you'll learn more about them throughout the film. Um, I have brought with me um, two of the collaborators on the project, as well as our filmmaker. I'm gonna just introduce them briefly now. Um, the first, Jocelyn Lee, is a first year PhD student at Stanford University. Although when she was um, at, uh, on the film, she was just beginning her graduate program at UMass Boston, which she finished this fall. Um, she is a historical archeologist as well, who studies race, diaspora, um, GIS and remote sensing through community collaborative archaeology. And she's currently developing her dissertation project um, on the Oregon Chinese Diaspora Project. Um, Jocelyn, do you want to say a couple words? Um, sure. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, this project was uh, participating in this field project was definitely a very um, important experience for me. I had dug a lot previously in China, but it was the first historical archaeology excavation that I had done in China. So it was a really great experience for me and kind of go with like a deep dive into historical archaeology studying the Chinese diaspora. Yeah. And then the next member of our team is Chelsea Rose. Chelsea Rose is, is also a historical archaeologist, and she is an adjunct faculty member at Southern Oregon University. Um, she also focuses her research on the settlement and development of the American West. Um, and she also is a cast member of PBS, um, PBS's show Time Team America. So some of you may have seen Chelsea before if you enjoy watching archaeology TV and movies. Um, she has also served as vice president of the Association of Oregon Archaeologists. And I should mention that both Jocelyn and Chelsea um, served as crew chiefs on our project that you're going to learn about through the movie. And Jocelyn is currently involved in ongoing analysis of the materials from Chengdong Village. Um, Chelsea, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Just um, I'm so happy to be here. This project was so um, fun and um, informative to be a part of. So it's really cool that uh, Barry was there filming it all in real time so that we can share it with everybody. Um, every time I look at the photos or rewatch this documentary, I, I learn more and remember more. So I'm just excited that it's getting out there and people are getting a chance to, to go on this adventure with us. Thank you, Chelsea. And then our fourth panelist, Barry Fong, is the director of the film. Um, Barry is a fourth generation Chinese American and a San Francisco native. And um, his activities as a filmmaker and community activist are well known here in the Bay Area, particularly among the Chinese American community. He has previously served as president of the board of directors for the Chinese Historical Society of America and has produced and directed numerous short films about the Asian American experience, including the 2016 film Digging to Chinatown 
and the 2018 film Finding the Virgo, um, both of which have earned several awards. Um, we, I just want to say on a personal note that Barry's involvement in this project was really transformative for all of us. He truly embedded himself as a filmmaker within our research team and participated with us throughout the entire project from start to finish, um, following us around with the camera, pulling us aside for quick interviews. Um, this, what you're going to see today is really unscripted archeology. span This is the project as it unfolded, um, the real archeologists, the real site, the real village community. And it really took a dedicated, um, a dedicated filmmaker who was willing to donate and participate for years at a time um, to really capture the totality of this research project. So um, with a lot of gratitude, I wanna turn it over to Barry to introduce the film. Thanks, Barb. That's a very, very generous uh, uh, introduction. And uh, I'm very grateful to be, have been part of the project and to have been able to travel with all of you to China. Um, I won't say too much about the film, I'll let it speak for itself, but it takes you from, you know, the inception of the idea all the way through, uh, you know, the actual archaeology and then the some of the conclusions that were drawn from the, from the research. Um, hopefully it'll be very clear to you, but I will be here afterwards to answer questions if it's not. Um, I want to plant two quick ideas um, in your heads before you start watching. One, mainly to do with documentary films. One, the two things that I think documentary films do really, really well are time compression and, um, and taking you to places where you normally don't have access. So this is a project, project that was about six years uh, in the running, um, you know, from just exploratory trips, planning trips, actual archeology span trips, and uh, tens of thousands of, of frequent flyer miles and lots of editing. Um, and so you get to see that compressed down into about 55 minutes. And the second thing is the uh, is access to places you don't normally go. So this is a part of China, which is a planes, trains, and automobiles trip, maybe a bus also in there. It's not like you you know get get on a plane and step off and you're right in the village. So it's 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 a trek to get out there. It's not a place that people would normally visit um, unless you have ancestral you know it's an ancestral trip for you. Uh, but tourists would not normally visit these places. So you get a peek into what the life is like uh, in there, in that area. So thank you again. Thank you, Danny. I'll hand it back to you and we'll, I'm looking forward to answering questions afterwards. Thanks. So yeah, we just uh, shared the poll results too. About 70% of our audience has not been to Southern China. And so you guys are gonna see some really cool things. Um, Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Just a couple reminders um, before we get started is that if you have any questions uh, for our discussion panel after the screening, um, please go ahead and, and put it into the Q&A chat box. So there's the chat box, but there's the Q&A section. So if you don't mind putting in there so we can moderate those. Uh, and then uh, again, if, if the volume is too loud or, or too low, you can adjust it on your own computers. Um, and if you can't stay for the whole 55 minutes, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put the the link to the site for you all to um, to save and view later on, on your own time. Also hoping that we don't have any uh, tech issues. So um, that will be there for you. So the tongdon.stanford.edu uh, documentary film. Okay. So I hope I don't miss anything. Um, please stay engaged uh, with all your questions. And um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back, everyone. That was a fascinating documentary. It's so informative. Um, and now uh, we're going to start our Q&A discussion panel. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, why the Changdong province? Um, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll start with that, but I'll also pass it on to the rest of the team. Um, you know, we were really lucky, as, a ch as, as Barry chronicled in the film, that, um, that um, Celia Tan, who's our co-investigator, um, introduced us to Changdong Village where she and her team at Wuyi University had been doing heritage research for quite some time. And one of the biggest concerns I had um, starting research in China, I don't speak Chinese, I can't speak directly to the residents of the villages where we have worked, 
was making sure that we were not going to be imposing or really causing any damage to the communities that we were trying to work with. Because Chandon Village had already founded itself as a heritage education center um, to really preserve and to celebrate the daily life of Chiaoxian, um, they already have um, facilities available for researchers to come visit. They host school groups and, um, and um, other educators programs from time to time. So having a group of 25 um, archaeologists descending on the village was not actually out of scale for them. Um, they also um, have done a lot of research on the history of their village so we could build on the research that was already done. Um, so that was the initial reason. I mean, I think the for me, the longer we worked in Chengdong Village, I also came to appreciate its uniqueness. Um, it is one of the founding um, villages of the Xie clan in that area. So it has a very deep history stretching back to 1200 AD and a very strong record of continuous leadership in the village um, so that we were able to talk directly to the village head and other members of the Xie clan um, and their families and really get a much more holistic picture about how migration came about and how it how the village persisted through all the changes that occurred in modern Chinese history. Um, Barry, I think you were there on that first trip. Um, do you have any thoughts about that first encounter? Um, yeah, I, I was there on that first trip and I think the, uh, the partnership was the key because I think there, the area is dotted with hundreds or maybe thousands of um, like villages and probably each with its own rich history, but um, the access that Celia was able to provide is was really the key to me that made it all possible. Great. Uh, we have a, a couple questions uh, filtering in. Uh, Lois asks, were you able to bring uh, any of the artifacts back to the United States or were you required to leave them there? Kelsey, can I punt that one to you? You were involved in a lot of the final artifact processing and you're currently working with the collection now. Yeah, so the collection stayed in country, it's there. And that was another part of this uh, race to gather all this data that's not always typical on an archeological project, which was not only did we have a constrained amount of time to, to do the research, to dig everything out, but we also had to clean and sort and analyze and photograph it all before we left. Um, and so that was another really, uh, you know, big part of it. And now, we have the other challenge of trying to, you know, go back and look at these artifacts from photos and the notes we took. So that can be a little bit um, difficult to, to get as much as we'd like out of the artifacts. But at the same time, uh, we, we had a pretty good, I'm pretty impressed with the, the protocol we put into place and the amount of work we, we got done during that time frame. So they're all there. Um, hopefully we will get to go back and visit them in person. But in the meantime, uh, we have a lot of data with us here that we can, you know, continue to, to, to look at them and learn more from them. Did you have a final count of how many, kind of a ballpark number? You. Barb probably knows that better than me, thousands. <laughs> I could have the report in front of me, thousands, tens yeah. of thousands, tens wow. of thousands of artifacts. Amazing. I don't know if you saw, there was that picture of, of the, like the Ziploc bags, the gallon bags, just absolutely stuffed. I mean, there was, it, you know, the lab side of this was a, a full-time operation. Um, you know, they were cleaning and sorting stuff as quick as it was coming out of the ground. So there was lots and lots of stuff. I'm sure. Uh, we have a question from Sarah. She asks, uh, Barry, uh, how did you choose the music for the film? Is it reflected with the time or the region? Yeah, so the, the flute playing there that you hear in the beginning and the end and in between, a uh, really fascinating, fascinating story actually is uh, played by a person Chelsea met. Uh, he is a uh, railroad worker descendant. His, uh, I believe, grandfather uh, worked on the railroad here in the U.S. and then went back and built, uh, worked on part of the uh, Suning Railroad in uh, southern China and became the head engineer. And, and, um, and the grandfather essentially uh, went insane because during when, when the Japanese invaded, they started tearing apart the railroad and he you know was heartbroken that all of that work was destroyed and that and the technology was destroyed um, and so he's a he is a very uh, well-known uh, flautist in uh, southern china 
and uh, and played for us and served us a beautiful dinner in his in his family's village. Mm -hmm. And we thought we actually were invited to interview him. And um, uh, the great story is we thought it was just him, and it turned out to be you know, his entire family and the entire village. It must have been 150 people that set up this huge outdoor meal for us. And um, it was quite a surprise and quite a pleasure. Yeah, we came around the corner of this alley, and everybody's sitting there waiting for us with this huge feast. And we were like, whoa, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty amazing. I was going to say, yeah, some of those pictures of that food look really good. Great there. Yeah. Um, we have a, a question from Molly. Uh, she's asked, what's next for the project? That's a great question. Well, right now we're in a little bit of a holding pattern because um, we had hoped to be going back to um, work with our partners at WUYI this year. And of course, with um, COVID travel restrictions, that's not possible. So our, our hope is that we will continue research on home villages. Um, we, one of the other participants of the project who's not here tonight, Laura Eng, just recently completed her dissertation work on another village, um, Wo Hing, which unlike Chengdong village, which was um, a, a village that railroad workers and other emigrants left from, Wo Hing was a village that was founded by returning migrants um, who built a new village adjacent to the village they had originated from. Um, and so she's just finished her dissertation research. We're really excited to see, she actually had just finished the field research before COVID hit, so great timing on that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really excited to see the results of her analysis. You know, Chengdong Village is really a beginning. I saw one of the questions in the chat was kind of how typical is this village of the area? Um, and one of the answers, I mean, you know, from our own travels, we see and some of the research that our collaborators have done, we do see similarities and differences, but from an archeological perspective, um, we now really have only studied two villages out of hundreds of thousands of villages in the Pearl River Delta that were sending villages for Chinese migrants. So I think the first priority for our project really is to increase our sample size, to study villages in different counties, to study different types of villages, villages from different clans, um, and I'm hoping we're going to be able to resume that research soon. Mm -hmm. Another important part of this project, too, um, was that it really opened the door for folks to do this kind of research. There was a lot of amazing collaboration and, and relationship building that uh, Barbara did and, and, and some of the other folks as well. And also, I think really importantly, people have been studying Chinese diaspora in the US for 50, 60 years. But kind of in a vacuum. And so now I think people are really um, more motivated and a little bit more pressured to, to look at this through this transnational lens because we see how much richer and, and more detail we can get out of this story. And that's, I think, really exciting going forward. And Jocelyn and I, uh, in our work in Oregon, we are actively looking at folks and trying to track their villages in China. And I did get to visit um, one of those villages as well to kind of um, to to you know do more of that um, site specific research in China to tie you know like Laura did some some stories on both sides. Jocelyn, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I guess just to kind of build off what Chelsea was saying in terms of our project in Oregon, I think one of the really benefits that we have from that project specifically is we also have like a huge archive, a lot of Chinese documents, and a lot of those just haven't been translated or like worked on any format whatsoever. So part of what I'm starting to do is kind of go through those and hopefully find more specific ties to certain villages to really kind of do like the step one of finding that more of that connection. Great. Uh, we have um, some questions from Mary Louise Days uh, regarding the ponds. Do you have any information on, on, on were they like rice growing ponds or they were used for any specific purpose or what they also use for sewage disposal in that area? Everyone's smiling because the ponds are so beautiful and they're every, <laughs> almost every village has at least one pond in front of it. Um, Jocelyn, do you want to explain the ponds or would you like, would you like one of us to take a stab at it? <laughs> um, I think I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> the ponds are known as fish ponds and they're primarily used for growing fish. Um, so semi-domesticated fish for consumption and um, they are seasonal ponds. They're dried out regularly 
um, and cleaned out and then and then rice and then water from the rice paddies are drained back into them fish stock is put in and then you know the fish grow and um, they are used for some garbage disposal primarily food waste so that the fish can feed on them and it looks like historically that the sewage um, canals that the, that the drainage canals in the village also flowed into that area right now the village has modern sewage so they're not currently being used for that purpose um, but they're really beautiful. And I think that it's one of the, um, you know, part of the rhythm. I mean, one of the things that I think for me was a really important part of this project was spending so much time in different seasons over several years in the same village and really getting a feeling for the interaction between the built environment and the agricultural landscape and how intertwined they were. And the ponds are really central um, throughout this area. It's a really important part not just of the economy, but of, of the aesthetics of, of the village as well. Plus there's the feng shui um, arrangement, right? Water in the front of the village, the hill. village and hill or mountain in, in the back. Mm. Probably one of the reasons that that site was uh, chosen because there's a mound in the back uh, of the village. And yeah. actually that's an exciting thing too. Um, spending so much time there and the first year we had quite a bit of downtime. And so looking at the like, like Barbara's saying, the rhythm of daily life, the way things flowed, the smells, the sights, all those different things. It really um, changed the way I view the sites that I'm working on here in the US. And one of the things that we always hear with Chinatowns, especially I primarily work in rural Chinatowns, oh, they're in this old, you know, crappy part of town. But I've been noticing that these Chinatowns, hmm, there's a hill in the back, there's water in the front. So some of these same traditions might be coming into the US and what people, what their white neighbors are interpreting as marginalized landscape that nobody cares about might actually be something that's desirable. And it could actually be um, something that we're not recognizing as um, continuity of culture or resistance um, in these US landscapes. And that's just one of the many things that's been so important for us to get over there, boots on the ground in these villages so that we can have that information when we're trying to analyze and interpret the, the lives, decisions, choices, opportunities of these folks here in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Therese Chen asking, how helpful were the villagers and what was their feeling towards the project? I found them very helpful. Um, so I don't speak Cantonese, unfortunately, but I do speak Mandarin. And I think one of like the most fun interactions I had was like, you know, when I spoke Mandarin for the most part, like they could understand me. And then like, I could almost understand some of the Cantonese that they were saying. But then I remember a couple like really great interactions where I would be asking, asking Mr. Xie like, oh, like what he thought of certain things. And when I felt really bad that I couldn't understand him, he actually just like wrote it down on like the sidewalk and like we were able to communicate through like written language um so that was like a really great moment for me um so i like they were so helpful and wonderful i i, I do miss interacting with them <laughs> right because you guys were there for three weeks about two months long. two months oh wow so yeah did you guys pick up any any useful expressions <laughs> <laughs> mm <-goy. laughs> yeah <I'm going. laughs> Very cool. Uh, Sarah asks, you note in the film that the Chinese people migrated before the gold rush. So what was their intent? Why would they leave their home at that time for the United States? So, you know, the history of this area is very complex, but one of the things that we've, we've really learned is that, um, you know, the mid 19th century was a period of a lot of turbulence and violence in this area. Um, and they weren't just, people weren't just leaving for the United States. In fact, they were migrating to South Asia long before um, large groups of people were going to Australia, the United States, Peru, Canada, Cuba, all kinds of places all over the world. Um, there was a lot of turmoil in the Qing dynasty, um, particularly in this area. This area was on the front lines of European attempts to colonize China. Um, the British Opium Wars occurred just about 40 kilometers away from where we were working. And although this area wasn't directly on the battlefields, a lot of refugees from the Opium Wars were crowding into Kaiping County. Um, there were also inter-ethnic wars between um, Hakka and Cantonese, sometimes called Punti, um, ethnic communities that were affecting this area. And there were also some natural disasters, um, droughts and floods. And so 
you know, the consistent story when we've been doing work in the United States, the consistent story that we often hear is that people were leaving that area, you know, not just Chengdong Village, but the whole Pearl River Delta. Um, the phrase it's often used is to fill the rice bowl, right? Not only for themselves to eat, but to raise money to send home through remittances so that their families could survive. And there's a story that several people told to me during the time we were working there. Different people would tell me the same story. It was kind of like an urban myth that was so widespread that I think it was true. And it, its essence was true. People would tell a story about a family, always a friend of a friend's family um, or the next village's family, where the parents sent four sons to, two, to four different parts of the world, Peru, Cuba, Australia, and the United States. And the idea was that the first one to make their fortune and start a business would then the other, the other three brothers would go join that person and they would all be successful and then send money home to take care of the parents, the wives and the children. And I think that during this period, um, you know, as Gordon said in the film, this was an area that had a very high rate of education, very strong business acumen, very strong trade relations with the rest of the world. And the, 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 the pressure from conflict and economic devastation and internal political strife um, really drove a lot of families to send family members abroad in order to survive. And um, this is part of what we see in the archaeology of Chengdong Village, right? These pits that were excavated for building purposes, that money, the money for those building projects came from remittances sent from overseas. And so the survival of communities like this really depended on immigration. Certainly things like the railroads and the gold rush were pull factors that drew people to certain locations, but out-migration was, was really going on from the early 1800s onward. The locations just changed. Mm -hmm. And to build on that, a lot of times in the kind of rhetoric in the historiography of the American West, it can portray Chinese migrants more like desperate refugees, when really it was this economic strategy. And when you go to China, and especially you know where we were, you can see how successful people were. These There's a built landscape that's directly tied to this out-migration um, that working with these architectural historians and, and these preservationists, we really got to, to see it up close. This uh, The Diallo Towers and these mansions, um, these are artifacts of on a large scale of the same relationship and um, that, we're, that we're looking at under the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we have a question from Paul. Were clan relations maintained within Western locales as chain migration settlements? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, okay. And Monica has a question. Was there anything you had hoped to find but did not find? Anyone? Let's, let's go around the room on that one because I bet we all have different different things we were hoping for. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I could start, I, I would say that going there, we might have had some questions, but we definitely left with more questions. And that's really par for the course for archaeologists. And even though people might think, but you didn't figure out everything. I mean, we now know what we don't know better than we did before. So um, that's a lot of progress. And, and I think that I didn't have any huge expectations or any specific artifacts in mind, because I didn't even know what I would, you know, what I didn't know. And so that, that was just, um, you know, anything we found was new information that has, you know, a ripple effect throughout this field. So I think that was exciting to be able to contribute in that way. Um, I guess I can go next. I'll be honest, like this was my first like Chinese diaspora dig. So I really came in here, I came into this project with kind of no expectations on kind of more of a personal experience part. I was really kind of curious in terms of like how my experience in ancient Chinese archeology span differed from how we were going to conduct historical archeology span in China, which I knew wasn't a thing. Um, so for me, like that was a very valuable experience and question answered. Um, but in terms of like specific to the research question, I kind of came into this project a little bit of a blank slate and I, I learned so much and obviously like now I have a lot of other questions that came out of it, but yeah. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I want to say that this project, this, we recovered much more than I ever expected and, and as Kelsey said, it opened up a lot of new questions we didn't have before. 
And that's often what research is like. You think you're answering one question, but really you're discovering more questions. If there was one thing that frustrated me, and I will share this, it's that we had really hoped to identify deposits prior to the start of mass migration. We wanted to really understand what was daily life like before there was, you know, and particularly family life, because out migration was very gendered. Primarily um, young men were leaving. Um, and so the villages were transformed into populations largely with, you know, older parents and younger children. Um, with that kind of middle generation of men often missing and their wives still being in the village. And so we know that family, um, you know, family relations really changed and household composition changed. Um, we wanted to get that baseline. And because of the massive reconstruction that occurred as a result of remittances in the village, um, those earlier deposits were pretty much destroyed through construction. And that's fine. That's actually the natural course of village development. Um, but I think, you know, when we get a chance to go back again, one of the things I'm really interested in is possibly there are some villages that were abandoned during migration. Not all villages made it through that period as communities. And I think if we were able to identify some of the sites of villages that were abandoned in the um, in, in the 1850s and 1860s, that would, those would be very interesting archeological projects. I would be really excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, Danny, I wanted to introduce a question that has been coming up in the chat right. around work on actual railroad sites in the United States. And um, I just wanna let everyone on the, you know, all the participants know that we've also done um, a really incredible, I mean, you know, this has been a huge collaboration among over 125 archeologists in North America We've studied literally hundreds of archeological sites related to Chinese railroad worker camps. Um, that information is available in different publications. There's a website at Stanford, Chinese railroad workers.stanford.edu that organizes all of that. One question that's come up has been, are there any films about that? And Barry, I know you were doing some oral history filming. Would you wanna talk a little bit about some of the interviews you did here in the United States? Sure, um, so we, um, I actually just completed a film called Celestials, and it incorporates uh, this film, parts of this film, and as well as a, um, a group of railroad worker descendants. We, so we managed to locate about 50 descendants around the country and, um, and compile them into kind of a, um, a, a profile, you know, of, if you will, of a, a typical Chinese worker. Um, and then the story, uh, the film also covers the, um, the way that the Chinese rail, railroad workers have been uh, recognized or not recognized here in the United States. Uh, the century, you know, the, the, century, the hundred year uh, anniversary of the completion of the transcontinental, um, the Chinese were kind of invited, Chinese representatives were invited and then swept off the stage at the last second. And then just recently, uh, the 150th year, uh, Connie Young, you, a, a local historian, was uh, asked to provide a keynote speech at the very beginning. So it was kind of a triumph, triumphant moment, but 150 years late, really, in my mind. Um, so that that film, um, you know, should be hopefully being shared. The plan was to share it this year, a little bit tough to do with COVID. Hopefully we'll be sharing it next year. Right. And Barry, there was another question actually for you. Uh, what was your favorite part of the filmmaking? Uh, process. Is there anything you feel like you missed looking back that you would uh, you would have liked to capture? Um, so actually, um, it's just a really um, fascinating part of the world to be in it. And every day, something would surprise me. Something about the people that were you know that are still living there, the people we are working with, the land, the use of the land, how they viewed you know how they view that how they view the world was completely fascinating to me. And uh, I'm not sure if I would you could ever capture that on film um, without actually being there. And, and um, you know, for instance, it's a very, it's a very tropical environment. It's damp and warm and humid. Um, and I think if you just saw the film, you might think it's, you know, like San Francisco, but it's, it's nothing like San Francisco. It's very jungly actually without the, without the human uh, impact it'd be, be very jungly. So um, uh, I, I actually really enjoyed looking at the architecture uh, from the visual standpoint, mainly because if you look across the front of the village, you, it tells you a story. It tells you a story of these single story gray brick buildings, which were kind of the standard typical. And then you see these 
multi-story, three, four, five-story build, buildings they call mansions that have these Western um, decorative elements. I wouldn't even call them architectural because I don't think they're architectural. And then you, and then you, and those are those are like built in the 20s and 30s, I guess, where money was coming back into China and they were able to build these bigger homes. And then you see these 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s um, stucco McMansion type homes um, right next to them. So you can just stand there and within 100 yards to see this whole span of, um, you know, the 200 year, year old home, the, the 100 year old home and the, and the, and the, the 30 year old home, 50 year old home. And I think a key part of that too is the how much this out migration has impacted the culture in these villages because rather than restore these beautiful historic buildings, um, they build new ones and that's because these historic buildings still belong to the families that are out around the world. And so they're holding space. I mean, the story is still active and that's another reason why, you know, it's important that we try to tell it right. Uh, you guys mentioned in, in, in the documentary about the kind of differences uh, handling archaeology from China and the United States. So can you guys talk a little bit more about that and, and difficulties you guys must have faced? Um, not only language barriers, but, but other concepts of archaeology. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that on since I was the one doing a lot of the, the, the conversations about that, that at that level. So, you know, I think one of the things that Historical archaeology is a very, uh, it's still very new within American archaeology. The discipline's about 60, the subdiscipline's about 60 years old. And in China, you know, in the United States, we define historical archaeology as the beginning of writing with the introduction of colonization. Now, there's a lot of problems with that definition. I'm just going to bracket that. <laughs> but in China, writing is very ancient. And so in China, archaeologists are usually located in history departments or in um, science departments, like geology departments or things like that. And so the kind of archaeology that we do in the United States that we call historical archaeology is just very different from the approach used by most archaeological teams in China. And I mean, Jocelyn can probably speak to this better than I can since you've been involved in that. Um, and maybe let me just ans answer about the negotiations. I think the biggest challenge we had was that, I mean, no matter where you work in the, in the world, it's true in the United States, true in China, everywhere else, there's a legal process for getting permits to do archaeological work. And the category of work that we do in the United States, that's not a category in the permit structure um, in China. And so we had to work with the local government officials, the Guangdong Provincial Institute of, of Archaeology and Cultural Relics, to find a pathway that would allow us to request a permit that didn't really exist. And we found some really creative ways of talking about that and of authorizing the work, as it was mentioned in the film, as folklore research with archaeological characteristics. And, um, and that was a really educational process for me um, because it was, like I said, you know, it was a, it was a very different process than what we've gone through before. There weren't really obstacles. Everyone was really supportive of this project. Everyone wanted it to happen. From the village head, the village residents, our, co our colleagues at Wu University, the archaeologists at the Provincial Institute, county officials, party officials, I was overwhelmed by the level of support. And so there was just all this kind of creativity in thinking about how do we create a structure within which this can happen legally and ethically. Um, Jocelyn, would you want to add anything from your observations about the differences between this project and the kind of um, research that usually happens in Chinese archaeology? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I've only really participated in academics, so very like research heavy type of excavations in China. So that does like operate a little bit differently. Um, and also I was mostly excavating in Northern China. So for me, there was also this kind of huge cultural difference that I honestly didn't realize that really existed between kind of Northern and Southern China until I actually got to excavate in Southern China. You know, like people talk about it all the time, but I think like experiencing it is a different story. Um, my family's from Taiwan. So it, like, I don't necessarily get as much of it as much as like the personal experience and all that. Um, but I had spent a lot of time in Northern China and then I had dug in 
uh, Kaiping. Um, in terms of like, you know, at, at least like for academic digs, a lot of times we open up these huge units. It's usually like four by four meters with a meter bulk. Um, we usually have a lot of kind of more local workers helping us excavate. Um, there's not, I, I mean, I think this is changing in, in Chinese archaeology, but like there definitely doesn't really exist the kind of like community collaboration, you know, usually you go into a village and then you have to do the X, Y, and Z type of research. Um, and there's complications that arise from that. Um, but there's not really this type of like communication that we actually had that was an ongoing conversation between the villagers which i thought was really refreshing and it was it, it was a good reminder of how we were really working in this like lived space and like why it's so important to do the work with as much care and nuance as we were trying to go for um yeah Great. thanks for that input um so we've got about three more minutes and uh, we have a couple more questions. I don't know if anyone had the answer to um, how many residents are in a typical village, at least for Tandong village. Do you guys happen to know? Well, at its peak at the time of out migration, Jenggun village had about 800 residents. Um, today, there are about 80 people who live there full time and then um, primarily older adults and then grandchildren. Um, some some um, mid-age adults, but not not very many. Most of them are working in either overseas or in local cities. Um, during festival times, during special events, during holidays, I think that population swells back up at least to around 400 or so. I mean, we were there for some mid-season events where there were a couple hundred people back at the village. And so it's definitely a home base, even if it's not everyone's home year round. Um, and we also met, um, we, we met people from the United States who were coming to visit their ancestral homes on vacation during winter break, um, met a family from San Francisco who at that time lived just a few blocks from where I was living. Um, so it's a very dynamic village uh, in terms of the number of residences, the number of people who think of it as home is probably probably very, very large. Got it. Great. Um, and I think we can kind of wrap up with one more question for that I hope we can all answer. Just kind of like uh, your biggest takeaway from the whole experience. Um, any last words on the project as a whole? Uh, I'll go. So one first, thank you all for your questions. There are some great questions on there and, I, and I'm afraid we won't get to all of them. But um, uh, my big takeaway is that if you have any interest at all in seeing this part of the world, that you should go now because um, these, there's, you know, at Chandong, there's um, preservation efforts going on, but in many, many of these villages, there's, there are no preservation efforts. And these are masonry structures that won't last forever with, you know, wood beam ceilings. Um, and you can see them collapsing as you kind of drive around the area. So if you have any interest, interest at all, I think you need to go there in maybe 20 to 25 years, there'll be far fewer structures to see. Chelsea? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I can't wait to go back. <laughs> I have many more things I want to check out. I want to, um, you know, continue to do work over there uh, as part of the Oregon project. And then as also love to go back to Qingdong. So um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Jocelyn, any last yeah. words? Um, yeah, I think one of my biggest takeaways was kind of understanding how different even like the bracket of like Chinese culture is. And like even as a Chinese American, like really understanding that and like truly experiencing like whether it's the food, the language, everything. Um, currently learning Cantonese to hopefully do this research better um, and be a better <laughs> representative for this type of history. But yeah, I think really acknowledging all the differences within what is quote unquote Chinese is a really big takeaway. Great, thanks. And Barbara? Well, you know, I, I think that um, I wanna bring it back to, you know, what this program is about, you know, which is commemorating um, the Asian diaspora and Asian American history here in Santa Barbara, um, where, this, where this event is hosted. And I, you know, I, I, the last 20 years of my research career have really been focused on Asian diaspora history and archaeology. And spending time in Guangdong province really trans was transformative for me as a scholar, as a researcher. Um, I see California differently 
having spent time there and having done this research. And I think that one of the, you know, we all know this on the West Coast that we're taught history from East to West. American history is always taught in that way. And Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation has done such a great job of highlighting the important things that were happening here on the West Coast long before this was part of the United States. But I think sometimes we forget that, you know, just as the Pacific theater was really, you know, we talk about the Pacific as a Spanish lake, you know, during the uh, 18th and 19th, early 19th century, I think sometimes we forget to continue that trans-Pacific story when we move into the American period in California. And it's one thing to know that intellectually, it's another thing to be in, in Chengdong village and to be talking to villagers who are asking if I happen to have met their relative who lives you know, the next neighborhood over in San Francisco or whatever it might be. Um, you really get a sense of the strong deep ties that continue to this day um, that have knit together the California, California and parts of the US West with Southern China. And I, I, it's something you can know, but when you feel it, it's different. And I think that, you know, I, I think that the work, Danny, that you and the other folks at the Santa Barbara Trust are, are doing is just so important in that regard. Um, you know, I built my early career on Spanish colonial history. I'm very familiar with the Presidio work uh, and the work at the De La Guerra Adobe. And it's really exciting now to be collaborating again on this time period and these communities. So thank you so much for having us. This has just been a wonderful event. Oh, the thanks go to all to you. We really are so happy to have uh, been able to pull this off so so last minute. So we appreciate all you guys, uh, Jocelyn, Barry, Chelsea, and lastly Barbara. Thank you so much for for all of the information. And and um, if anyone wants to check out that that video again, um, you're able to to go to the link and stream it there. Um, otherwise, uh, you will be receiving a survey. We hope you can uh, fill that out and let us know give us some feedback. But um, again, thank you for attending. And we hope to see you uh, again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night.